A person's experience of an alternate reality, also called parallel universe, can vary from a momentary glimpse to a whole life-changing shift into what becomes a permanent existence. Here, two Weird World viewers relate their lived events, one a relaxed lunch in a scenic cafe that never existed, and the other bringing devastating change. Earth 2.0 Paul Calizzo has lived in Rhode Island for all of his life and had been to Newport many times, especially the Newport Creamery there that is now a different store. One day in the summer of 1995, his lifelong friend Kenny asked him if he wanted to take a ride to Newport as he had a dental appointment, and so the friends agreed to get lunch afterwards. Paul waited in the car during Kenny's appointment after which they drove into downtown Newport, where Paul parked his car in a familiar spot he knew behind two nightclubs. They walked down America's Cup Avenue to Thames Street, noticing an ESPN sign indicating that that day the ESPN network was in Newport telecasting some games. Because of the big event, there was a Ferris wheel and other makeshift activities. Paul remembers looking up at the top of the Ferris wheel and seeing a completely dark grey overcast sky as it continued to be all morning. Walking down Thames Street, they turned right at the Shell gas station into Wellington Avenue and as they did so, he said to Kenny, that's weird, I just felt like I just jumped up and down. As they turned on to Wellington Avenue, Paul saw a wall slant downward and the slant got lower as he walked. When it became low enough for him to see over it, he could observe the ocean and all of the boats near the wall. He observed little wooden stands selling souvenirs and with a wooden floor as a pathway. He could see that the merchandise stands could close by pulling down the front covers and they had holes at the top and bottom where a padlock could be inserted. All of a sudden, he saw the sun emerge as a huge burst of sunshine hit him and he said to himself, Wow, the sun came out fast. He and Kenny walked into a business district he had never seen before, which was loaded with shoppers, a very busy two-way street. He can still recall a bus stopping nearby. He walked by some restaurants and looked at their menu on the outside wall, but they were way too expensive for the lunch they were looking for that day. So they kept on walking and saw a Newport Creamery. Paul remarked, well, wow, I've never seen this one before, and so they went in and ate there. As they sat and ate, the register was to his left, and he looked out of the glass walls. He had a view of the ocean, and he was watching people play frisbee and walk their dogs on the grass, where there stood a bandstand gazebo-type structure. The sun was still bright, with not a cloud in the sky. The business district was so alive and so vibrant, he could not wait to tell his wife. He and Kenny walked back to the car the same way they had arrived and, to the best of his knowledge, he believes it was overcast when driving back home. When Paul picked up his wife from work, he told her, wait until you see where I'm taking you Saturday night. That Saturday, he and his wife went to Newport, this time driving when they turned down America's Cup Avenue to Thames Street and took a right at the Shell Station. But he did not see that slanted wall, just a ball field and an apartment building. So he turned back and drove around for half an hour, then finally gave up. He tried to take his wife to this business district in Newport twice more that summer and repeatedly from 1996 to 1999. In 1999, Paul walked every street, side street and road off America's Cup Avenue and Thames Street for about three hours, but found nothing. He bought his first computer in 2000 and did a web search for Newport Creamery, Newport, Rhode Island. There were two listed. The one he knew so well at the now Panera Bread store and the one on Bellevue Avenue. At this stage, he said to himself, there is the answer. They went to the one on Bellevue Avenue, and that conclusion was satisfactory for over a decade. However, in 2012, he discovered Google Street View and looked up the Bellevue Avenue location. He was startled to see that this was not the restaurant he and Kenny had been to in 1995. 
there was no ocean view and no shopping district, as he had so vividly observed. He thought that maybe Google Street View did not pick up the right angles. He finally went to the Bellevue Avenue Newport Creamery in 2012 and even walked behind the Newport Creamery. It was in a little plaza on Bellevue Avenue and there was definitely no ocean view, no shopping district, no slanted wall and no bandstand gazebo. Finally, Paul spoke with Kenny about it. Kenny said that that area was also unfamiliar to him as well and that there was something strange about that day in 1995. Unable to forget this puzzling anomaly, Paul's curiosity exploded in 2016 when he began to ask long-time business owners in Newport about the 1995 location. No one knew about this Newport creamery. Paul phoned the Newport City Clerk's office and they confirmed to him that there had never been another Newport creamery other than those two registered in the town of Newport, Rhode Island, and that they had never moved from another location. He told a co-worker of his experience. This man worked with engineering maps and he said to Paul that he was familiar with Newport. Paul described his experience the best he could. The slanted wall, the boats, the ocean. And he said, I think I know where you're talking about. He pulled it right up on the maps and Paul could see the satellite view, exclaiming, oh my God, that's it. But the area was deserted across from the ocean. There was no business district and no wooden stands selling souvenirs, although there was room there for it. There was about 100 yards of grass and vegetation in front of some elevated houses. In other words, the area across from the ocean is undeveloped land. Paul believes that on that original day he and Kenny entered a vortex where they slung shot around the other side of Wellington Avenue. They were on what he calls Earth 2.0, this was not a time slip as there was nothing either very dated or futuristic about the different reality they entered. The only thing he now sees as suspiciously strange was how the weather went from a charcoal grey sky on one side of the street to cloudless total sunshine after they made the turn at the Shoal station. This was when he had the sensation that he had just jumped and landed on his feet. To this day, in the area where he observed the vibrant activity, that land is still undeveloped. He is prepared to take multiple lie detector tests that this really happened and confident that he would pass every one. He has stood on the exact spot where he dined on his lunch in 1995, looking across at the bandstand and bustling stalls, which he now knows is a permanently vacant side of the avenue where no restaurant has ever been at least not in this world. Can I swap back? Angie Francis lives near Atlanta in Georgia in the US. She reports that in some kind of devastating shift, one cold November morning in 2010, she woke up in a parallel world. To her knowledge, she had suffered no trauma that caused this, but the mental and emotional trauma came to her because of it. She woke up to everything being slightly altered. A different type of refrigerator in the kitchen, a slightly different patterned chair, shrubbery in her yard that she recalled planting was just gone, with no one having any recollection of the previous planting's existence apart from her own. It caused her to panic, whereupon her husband took her to the hospital and she was sent for a mental evaluation. They found nothing wrong with her, but in the coming days, more and more differences became apparent. Angie's husband had taught their daughter how to make a cricket sound. Now, her daughter could make the sound, but both she and Angie's husband were dumbfounded that Angie thought he had taught her, as he could not make the sound. This was so strange to Angie, as they both used to make the sound all of the time. Distressingly, her parents could also not recollect the same memories of her childhood that she could. Most importantly, the bonds with her entire family were gone. Her daughter had a totally different personality and her husband seemed not to care about her at all. It was as if they were totally different people and they seemed to regard Angie as having gone insane. This just led to even more trauma and Angie now suffers from PTSD. 
still feeling stuck in this world that she does not belong in, she longs to go back to the life she remembers. She has divorced and no longer has any relationship with her now adult daughter or any other family members. She feels like they are not her true family, but imposters. Their personalities are so different and cold. Angie supposes that she herself is the true imposter, now living a quiet and solitary life. Occasionally, she looks at the news and wonders if this world's hardships have affected her old world. Sadly, she supposes that she will never know, but certainly hopes not. Angie adds that about three months after she slipped into this different dimension, she, her husband and daughter, went to Jamaica on vacation. They took a night boat trip to a lagoon known for its bioluminescence. When they arrived at the lagoon, her husband suddenly just exclaimed excitedly, Angie, we swapped. He seemed shocked that the words had come out of his mouth, and when Angie asked him repeatedly what he had meant, he just said, I don't know, nothing. He became angry about her questioning and did not speak to her for the rest of the time they were on the excursion. Angie often wonders if the other version of her that she swapped with somehow managed to cause that. She wishes she knew how to swap back.